Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and we've got another episode coming up right now. Uh, our guest today is Dr. Ben Merkel. Uh, he is a teaching elder at Christ Church there in Moscow, Idaho. He's a husband and a father of five. Uh, he's also the president of New St. Andrews College, liberal arts college there in Moscow, Idaho. Uh, he's done a lot of work, travels a lot, and he's taken some time today to talk about a number of issues regarding education, uh, raising children, and just a lot of practical things that sometimes we uh, just forget about or we don't, we kind of just put it in cruise control and we think someone else is going to take care of it. So we're going to have a good conversation. So enjoy the show. All right, Ben, Dr. Merkel, how are you doing today, sir? Fantastic. Uh, great to be here. Yeah, no, thanks for coming. Uh, I appreciate you taking some time. I really do. I know we've talked before, and yeah, I wanted to kind of elaborate uh, and, and flesh out a few things that we talked about uh, last time. That was a number of months ago, and yeah. uh, look at some new things uh, regarding, as I said, with just raising children. I know a lot of people have kids, right, and, and we're really in a tumultuous time, I think, with government schools, you know, in the last several years now, three years, four years. But even before that, with critical theory and as, as even Doug Wilson says, you know, the, the, the public schools are socialism, right? They, they are these things. They're teaching these things. And it's like, wait a second, why are you teaching? And parents get uh, upset and it's like, well, hold on. This has been this way for a while. And yeah. so I think now's the time to, to get out. And, and it's been the time. But we're going to talk more about that and not just, OK, get out. Now, what do you do? Because uh, it's easy to leave the school in one sense, but now what do you do? So we're going to be talking about that and a number of, of other things. Um, we'll just jump jump right in. Uh, the first question that I wanted to talk about, um, you talked a number of months ago, and I've heard you say it in other podcasts and things, uh, regarding uh, your upbringing, kind of just suburbia, evangelical, and really looking at life you know, in the 80s and the 90s and into the 2000s. And... Uh, how that's really different, how you live today and how you're raising your children and church life and schooling, how it's really different. You were in the military. Uh, you didn't do well in public school. Um, and now you have a degree from Oxford, I mean, a PhD. Like that's, 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 not, that's not easy, right? There's a yeah. some, some radical shift happen. So can you just kind of th flesh that out a little bit for the audience and kind of give a little bit of background on, uh, on uh, yeah, that? Yeah, well, okay. So, um, yeah, I was raised in a um, kind of your standard evangelical family, um, uh, went to a private Christian school, your very standard uh, 1980s. OK, uh, not public school. school. Sorry. OK, gotcha. Yeah, well, no, I, I went to a private school through eighth grade and then in ninth grade. So for all of high school, I went to the public school gotcha. um, okay. and uh, it, it was just very much your kind of, I don't know standard American upbringing. I feel like uh, if you've seen the movie Napoleon Dynamite, I know it was <laughs> it, it was not made or it was not set in the 80s, but that basically captured what like, you know, going to high school in southern Idaho in the 80s. That's exactly what it was like. So yeah, and that's where they shot the movie, too, was Idaho. That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. No, if, if, if you watch that movie, actually, a lot of people don't realize that there's so much um, Mormon uh, inside jokes in that movie. That oh, if really? You, if you're raised in Southern Idaho with Mormonism all around you, you pick up on a whole bunch of it, but it's, it, it was anyhow. Side, that's side track. Um, no, I, I love that movie though. That's, that's the world that I came from. Um, yeah. I, I actually, I, I joined the Marines just straight out of high school simply because of just, I wanted something exciting and scary that would, you know, um, I, I went on to college, uh, um, I started at Boise State University and just about uh, probably would have um, been expelled. I mean, I was on academic probation oh, wow. and all that, but um, uh, I think Saddam Hussein kind of saved my academic career because my unit was activated and I got to drop out of all my classes. Um, my nice. orders were canceled because I had not gone to tank school. So this, this, th this thing happens a couple of times. I end up at University of Idaho. I'm also bombing all my classes. Um, and really what it was, was I was your, your, your typical American kid where I had plenty of intellectual potential and whatnot, but I had zero discipline, drive or purpose. And so I flunked classes, not so much because I couldn't understand the material it was because I didn't show up to class because I was out 
playing cards or doing something really stupid. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, but it was, it was a campus crusade Bible study, um, at the university of Idaho that, um, my second year here that I got pulled into and, uh, just realized, uh, re remembered again, the truth of the gospel that I'd been raised with. I had, I definitely, you know, my, my parents had gotten divorced and I'd gone to public school and I had, uh, I had cooled in my faith significantly, but it was in that campus crusade Bible study, um, that I, um, God rekindled in me a love for the gospel. But I realized at that moment that if I was going to, if I was going to take um, my faith seriously, then I needed to mortify the flesh. And the thing that dominated my flesh was laziness. Mm. Um, and so what I ended up doing was I was, I was bombing so many classes and I started just trying to apply myself to my studies. And it really was weirdly a, uh, um, a manifestation of me being serious about my faith. I wanted to actually serve God and, and be obedient. And um, the funny thing was the class that was most creaming me was um, chemistry. <laughs> and so I doubled down on chemistry, didn't do very well. So I signed up for the next chemistry class and worked really hard at it, you know, improved my grade, grade slightly. And I just kept taking chemistry class after chemistry class until I could get an A in chemistry. Mm. And by then I had essentially a chemistry major. Um, so I went all the way through the whole chemistry course. I, I did a um, education degree. So I would be a high school chemistry teacher, but that was simply because every pastor I knew was a teacher and I really wanted to go into ministry. So that's how, that's how I got there. That's how I started taking, um, taking learning seriously like trying to actually work hard, um, with my mind, mm -hmm. but it was, but it, I, I had zero love for chemistry. I didn't like it at all. I, the second I graduated, I never touched another test tube or, um, you know, balanced another equation as soon as I graduated. And that was primarily because right at the tail end of my studies, I started to realize more the depth of the Christian faith and how much it opened up intellectually um, into a whole world of learning, you know, okay. I think it started with reading a, um, Francis Schaeffer book, this little book, it was the, um, escape from reason. Yep. And I remember just grabbing it because I was intrigued by the cover and I started trying <laughs> there, there we go. Literally sitting on top of one of my stacks right here. That's funny. Well, I started reading that and man, I could take 20 minutes to read one page and still didn't understand it, but I mm -hmm. knew that there was something really profound there. And I, I would just, I, I had to go back over and reread and reread until, but as I did it, it just started unlocking so much for me in my understanding of who God is, what this, what's going on in this world, what we're here to do. Um, and so then I started reading more and more. I remember also reading a book by Kent Hughes, um, Disciplines of a Godly Man. Um, mm -hmm. We did it in a Bible study and um, it was a, it was a profound study. It was just really helpful in my spiritual walk, but we, get to the end of the book and he has interviewed all of these great men who I had, you know, massive admiration for theologically. And he asked them, what are their top five books? And he, and each, each of these guys lists their top five books and all of them um, are lift, listing Calvin's institutes. Um, uh, I believe Dostoevsky, some Tolstoy. Yeah. And it was this, this kind of like world that I thought, this is what great Christian men are like. This is how they become what they are. I want to start becoming like that. Mm. And I started giving myself my own reading list. I had nothing to do with chemistry um, and um, becoming really just intrigued by uh, th this world of learning. Um, and then eventually it ended in, you know, I took a massive sort of, I ended up in a, a master's in English literature uh, and then going on to do my, my other graduate work. Yeah. Wow. No, that's a crazy turn of events uh, yeah I'm, I'm not i'm not as radical well i mean i was kind of typical too uh but yeah i didn't i didn't i think my claim to fame is i don't think i really read a complete cover to cover book through all of school now there was cliff's <laughs> notes and my mom would read i'd somehow convince her to do that or i'd read parts and you know whether it's shakespeare or whether it's just a, a book i remember reading like hatchet you know the in sixth grade and and, uh -huh. and uh Bridge to Terabithia and these other books. And honestly, I feel like, cause I went, I'm from California. Uh, I, I want to get the list from like the nineties, like the books I should have read and get them and just have <laughs> a stack and work through them and be like, I should have read these. I'm sorry, Lord. 
yeah. but I didn't care. And once I came to faith, I mean, I stopped caring about sports and really started caring about reading and things that, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, there'd be no way you would have told me, oh, yeah, this is what you're going to be like when you're older. I'd be crazy. Oh, I, yeah, the, crazy. The, the, it's just it's nuts. The only books I would have worked through, you know, in high school would probably been like a Louis L'Amour. And that would be the extent of my yeah. reading. And I remember, you know, having conversations about, yeah, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, I took one of those tests that tells you what you should be. And I scored as train conductor. Um, <laughs> And uh, I remember telling my mom, I want nothing that involves either a desk or books. Um, and I did not. <laughs> I missed. Uh, and missed. that's not working. Yeah. I hear yeah. you. Uh, no, I appreciate you sharing on that. Um, I guess second question, really looking at uh, when, I, like I said, looking, listen to some other interviews that you've done after mm -hmm. our last conversation and, um, you know, just knowing your work a bit more and what you've been doing for much of your adult life um you said and it was in it was a conversation when you kind of go back to when you were in university of idaho and you were doing gospel tracks and and things but then you had a conversation uh or i guess it was in a class with one of the professors yeah. and professor there at university of idaho talking about latimer and ridley and their martyrdom uh, yeah. elaborate on that some more because i think even for myself sometimes i feel you know, sometimes I feel like we're trying to sell Jesus. And actually, I think it's Doug Wilson also that planned this, but yeah. you know, where he's like, we're trying to get Jesus on the ballot. You know, if you would just vote yeah. for Jesus, everything would be okay. And whether that's um, a post mill, pre mill, whatever, but we're just trying to sell Jesus, just accept, you know, just get the little paper and just get Jesus. Yep. Can you just, just <laughs> vote for him? Just, just add Jesus to your life and it'll be fine. And right. in, in one sense, a lot of evangelism, I think, is like that, whether it's open air preaching or gospel tracks, not to discount those things. I've done those things. I think there's, there can be benefit to those things, but um, I think a lot of it is 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 richer and deeper when you're either having conversations with people over dinner or coffee or or even yeah. in a classroom or at work. Uh, and you're saying in the classroom, what what happened with this liberal arts professor, and, and what did he say? And and this 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 richness that kind of struck you. Yeah. Well, those. so so this is kind of right at um, this turn in my life where I've started thinking like, I need to, I need to read, I need to be um, intellectually engaged and whatnot. Um, and, uh, but I had just graduated and I gotten a job um, actually with that same guy who was leading that Bible study. He had, he had uh, left campus crusade and he was now um, a, uh, he had started a campus ministry from Christ church. Okay. And um, so my first job was working for him doing campus evangelism. Um, so I really wanted to be in ministry, but I was becoming more interested in this intellectual life. At the same time, I had a I had massive chips on my shoulder about, um, you know, I was a science guy. I was a math science guy. And I, I um, theology and philosophy um, seemed to be um, robust and intellectually engaging. But the broader liberal arts, particularly literature, I still had a hard time granting it as something that could be real. Um, <laughs> and and uh, at, at the time, I was actually, um, I was working out. Uh, there was a guy who was my my lifting partner. I was doing a lot of weightlifting with this guy as a good friend. And we wanted to use the University of Idaho gym. Uh, but to do it, I had to be a student at the U of I. And I had this way in my mind that I could explain my my tuition to take one course would be equivalent to a gym fee. And I, you know, I had this way of justifying it. So anyhow, I, I signed up for a course. I think I started in a philosophy course or something, but there was another guy in a Bible study I was leading who said, Hey, you should drop that class and take this class on Chaucer with me. Mm. And I just thought that sounded like the dorkiest thing of all time. Cause like a like a medieval poet, like it just seemed, <laughs> Yeah, um, boring. No. Yeah. And he said, he said, no, um, take this class. We'll sit at the back. We can make fun of the English together, majors together. And I was like, well, that actually did sound like kind of fun and maybe a noble calling. So, um, <laughs> so I did, I, I transfer over to this, um, this lit class and um, it was a spring semester class, meaning it starts in January. So I remember going up to the, we're sitting in the classroom, um, you know, snow blowing and it's, it's freezing cold outside. It's kind of a blizzard. We're, and the prof walks in and I think he's wearing like cut off jean shorts, a T-shirt, and he just lights the class up. And he mm -hmm. was former Army Airborne and um, swore like it and 
throwing people out of class. And it was like this intense, <laughs> intense wow. class. And he knew his stuff really well. He actually was like a fairly liberal Jack Catholic, but he had enough of an appreciation of the gospel, the church and whatnot, that he understood its role in this literature. And he was just really engaging. Mm-hmm. So, so that's the the setting. And we're in this one, we're going through Chaucer and we're reading, and I can't even, it's, it's been 20 some years since this class, but we're reading one of the, um, one of the tales where it, it's basically a medieval saints lives and, and the medieval saints lives, there's kind of a whole genre here where they tell the story of a saint getting martyred. And in the medieval conception, a saint is someone who is like kind of floats three feet off the ground and everything they do is perfect. They glow. They have no problems. Yeah. And what always will happen is when they're getting martyred, you know, they'll like drop them in a vat of boiling oil and they'll they'll go, oh, it's kind of cold in here. Could you turn the temperature up? Because yeah. nothing will really touch them because they're right. saints, you know, they're otherworldly. And we're, we're doing this and, uh, and, he, and he stops and he goes, okay, now... And he gets um, Fox's Book of Martyrs and he reads that account of uh, the the uh, martyrdom of, of Ridley and, and Latimer. And um, and he, he, if you know that that account, it's so vivid and so graphic and so visceral. Like mm-hmm. these are people who feel it like like and, and you really know they feel death and they feel pain and they are human men and they're they're um, they're really human. So he's reading this and I look around and it's like all of these students, these classmates of mine, uh, I'm a grad student now, they're undergrads, but they, they're, you know, girls are crying, people, everybody gripped and he gets done with it. And he says, this is the, this is the difference between a Protestant and a Catholic understanding of justification. Um, And, and he walks through the two different views where basically, um, is justification this perfection that 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 um that that makes you this you know or, or basically he's applying it to what what is a saint um but he's talking about justification is a saint somebody who's otherworldly perfected or is a saint like you and I and it, and it really is a, a discussion about justification and I realize we're in the middle of a deep conversation about uh, theology and salvation itself and everybody is gripped by this conversation. And I'm a campus evangelist going around with my gospel tracks, and I can't get anybody to this to this point. Mm-hmm. And I realize there there are there is a way of covering um, the liberal arts that takes you to the heart of who you are and what you believe about the world that really forces you into an encounter with who God is and what salvation is. And um, and I started finding that in my work as a teacher, because about this time I started teaching at New St. Andrews. Um, And in my work as a teacher, I was having more formative effect on the souls of these students than I was in any of my other work. And it really just opened my eyes, the power of this kind of education. Yeah, no, that's really good. And I think that's something that we have just going back to the, you know, vote for Jesus type of evangelism um, is it's very sterile and sanitized. And I think a lot of that also comes to do with just our really bad understanding of the supernatural. And we have just like, we, we think, you know, God's up there somewhere and, you know, he's, he's either pleased or he's not, and he's kind of locked in time, but no one would really say that. Of course he's not locked in time, but, and then there's like the devil and he's in hell and there might be some demons here and there, but like, that's it. There's not really fallen angels and are the fallen angels are the, are the bad ones. Are they all locked away in Tartarus or are there some out or, you know, what is Enoch and what are the giants and like all this stuff, all of a sudden you're like, wait a second. What's going on here? And then you you listen to these stories of history or or these uh-huh. legends and these myths, and you're like, are these people just making this stuff up, or is this is there some truth to this? Like you're saying uh-huh. with uh, Latimer and Ridley, you know, there's these guys were martyred and they felt it, and it was deep because they're real. Yeah, and it's like this other one; these other people were martyred too, but it's kind of fanciful and it's yeah. eh, Roman Catholic, like it's pretty soft around the edges. And so having this like partial view of like who Jesus is. Like we often will, Oh yeah, he's God. He's God. He's God. And it's like, well, yeah, but he's also a man. You know, he yeah. also hungered. He was also tired. He also wept. And, and of course the liberal, the liberals and, and unbelievers will, Oh, Jesus was just a good teacher. He's just a man right. and this and this, right. and they'll not give any credence to him being God. And so there's this kind of really giant piece often missing 
Uh, and I think I see that a lot just in the local church uh, here. We're in Kentucky and, you know, the Midwest, South yeah. and yeah. a lot of America where you just you don't have a very good understanding. I'm not sure. I have theories on why that is. We won't get into it, but <laughs> it's 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 a good story. And I, I love hearing things like that because um, it means that there's more than just you know, sign on this dotted line to accept Jesus. Now you're good to go see in yeah. heaven. You know, there's no discipleship. There's no training. There's no anything. Yeah. Um, coupled with that, uh, third question, thinking about Christian education. We were talking earlier before we went live yeah. uh, about education in general. I think it's, I think it's pretty a slam dunk for anybody now to say, yeah, public school, government schools, they're corrupt. They're evil. I don't care that, you know, your, your mom went there or, you know, your aunt still is an assistant there or something like that. It's, it's, there might be an exception, rare exception somewhere, but you got to get out. And if you're a Christian listening, get out of public school <laughs> or get <laughs> yeah. your kids out. Uh, but that being said, I mean, there's, there's homeschool, you know, we're not in Germany mm -hmm. where homeschool is illegal. We can homeschool here, which is nice. Right. Uh, there's public or uh, private schools in general that aren't necessarily Christian. And of course there's Christian private schools, but then there's like classical schools and hybrids. There's all sorts of things. Can you flesh out a little bit for me, for us, what the difference is between a classical Christian school and just like, Oh, it's a Christian school or it's a Christian yeah. Academy or, right. or, or, or whatever. What, what are the differences? Yeah, I think first of all, it, it's, um, I'm glad you said it like that. Cause I do think it's important to say classical Christian. Um, I think that, that a lot of people have seen, the fruit of the classical Christian movement and then try to kind of uh, minimize the Christian and just make it classical, which is sort of yeah. like, you're just making this kind of like, I don't know, Tony prep school um, yeah. <laughs> where, where, yeah, um, it, it, it becomes a lot of intellectual posing, but you've, you've subtracted out um, or at least minimized the, the, the gospel presence, which I think um, is, is, is just, um, you know, to steal from my father-in-law's favorite, you know, image it's to take the car that's going towards the cliff at a hundred miles an hour and you're just slowing it down to 80 or 60. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I do think that classical considered by itself is, is superior to what's going on out there, but classical comes out of Christian. And I think that it's really important that you have that. Mm -hmm. So um, classical Christian education, I think the thing that, that really, um, makes it distinctive would be, there'd be a, a couple of different pieces to it. Um, first is the, um, the content that you're working in. You're, you're working in um, the great works of um, basically the Western tradition, which is the tradition that the gospel has um, came into and, and grew to fruition inside of um, and, uh, and, and shaped significantly. And I think that um when you step in to that tradition and realize the wealth, the intellectual wealth of what we've been given through what the gospel has done in our world, um, it, it's, it um, inoculates you against a whole host of um, really stupid uh, intellectual fads that, that are passing around right now. Um, yeah. There's, I think, a lot of the turmoil that we're experiencing as a nation is the fruit of us um, walking away from that intellectual heritage. So, um, you know, our understanding of government, of economy, all of these things grow out of this long tradition and these great works that we've um, been studying. And when you toss that, that heritage, then the constitution doesn't seem that important anymore. And the significance of some of these freedoms doesn't seem that important anymore. Um, so, so one one piece of it, I think, is the actual um, intellectual heritage that we're working in, the great the great works that we're working in, the humanities. Um, but then, but then the other piece of classical is an actual kind of method that you're working through, and I and I think a lot of people will. Um, it's sort of really difficult to just summarize the whole thing, and there are there are a lot of different ways of coming at it. But I think that the primary thing is that you're you're focusing on teaching the mind of these students. You're mentoring that mind in how it thinks and how it, it communicates and expresses itself. So you're going through the basics, uh, the basic rules of logic so that you understand how to think critically and process argumentation. But there's usually a very heavy emphasis on language, 
both coming in and going out. There's um, this is why um, languages, classical languages like Latin become so synonymous with classical education because you're learning how words themselves work. And by going to different languages and Latin is such a great one for establishing kind of the framework of your mind. You could do other languages, but I think Latin is particularly suited towards helping you to dissect how words work. And then also going back to my first argument, Latin unlocks this Western tradition, which I think is really important. Um, so, so you're you're learning how um, how words work. You're learning how um, to read, how to read critically. But then you're also learning how to speak and uh, persuasively, logically, and um, and elegantly to be able to persuade others. So there's a heavy amount of uh, rhetoric, learning how to write, learning how to speak, learning how to argue that goes in it. So you're you're focusing on becoming a certain kind of person, which is very different than how um, uh, I think um, most public school and um, secular education is increasingly aimed at um, imparting to you certain sec um, vocational skills. We're going to certify you and how to code, how to work an Excel sheet, whatever. Um, it's you're you're learning how to do tasks rather than how to think and understand the world, um, and I think. In the long run, the, the, that classical education is vastly superior and equips you to pick up skills very easily, but to be somebody who actually understands how to rightly deploy those skills. And I would say in the middle of all of that, um, that, that Christian, I think, is just really important because you're doing all of this while understanding who you are in Christ who God is, what this world is like, and what he would have us do in it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it all has to be inside that, that gospel context. Yeah. Yeah. I think you said it in our last conversation, um, uh, whenever that was, I guess last summer, I think. Uh, but <clears throat> the, the basically schools just kind of, especially even colleges, universities, et cetera, secular schools, basically creating you to be a cog in the machine. Yeah. And I, I love that imagery because you're you're really once you see that you understand why people get so bent out of shape when you say something like, you know, borders are are fine or a baby's a baby or marriages between a man and a woman or whatever. Um, you know, people get all. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we could, we could have a million examples, but you see these reactions of these people, and they're just you know they're 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 unhinged and. Uh, whether yeah, it's on Twitter or it's a, a YouTube video or something on Instagram you see and it's like you can't be you can't be serious like are you are you for real yeah. right now I think yeah. I think that's a good example of of the fruit of what we've done because we've removed critical thinking and 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 yeah. you know be able to walk through an argument and and interact with it intelligently we've removed that and now you look at our public discourse and it is um it is inflammatory tweet, you know, that that's, that's kind of the, 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 the height, like, like that, that's the pinnacle of our interaction right now is, is the flinging of inflammatory tweets when, mm -hmm. and, and you'll have people say things that are just ridiculous and you want to sit and say, okay, let's walk through that. Let's walk through uh, that. And, and I think it, it's not so much that these people can't um, provide an intellectual defense of their position. They're at the point where they don't, they, they, it's never occurred to them that that might be something that they ought to be able to do. Um, like, like, like they really don't think that argumentation, that, that their convictions need support from argumentation. It, it's simply, they're just repeating, um, they're repeating um, the, these inflammatory tweets or the, these various mantras that they've been, uh, you know, indoctrinated in. And the fact that they've been indoctrinated in, in, in these um, sentiments is for them all they need to believe it. They don't right. need any like intellectual framework to support it. Uh, uh, and, and, and that's really the fruit of the education that we've been giving them. Yeah, no, that's really good. That's kind of like a, you know, people will mock, well, you just have faith in faith or something like that. And it's like, well, you know, no, so faith has a substance. Um, but it seems like that's, I would say that a lot of these people have the faith in, in the system of the idea that that yeah. thing yeah. is like, it's 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 a classic circular reason. Well, well, th think about how um, how the word science has been waved about over the last three years, as if saying the word science makes everybody have to be quiet. Right. And like science used to be actually this whole process that you had to go through, um, and and now it's something that you can you can um, you know 
you know, MSNBC uh, gave you a, a headline and that's all you needed to say science. Um, right. And that's not science. That's not thinking. Um, mm. it, but that's the world we live in now. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. There's a total offbeat, but not really. Uh, there's like a dog food commercial that pops up uh, for like, you know, five seconds because we watch YouTube on our TV. And, and it's like, blah, blah, blah. Science did that. And my wife's like, people did that. Science isn't any, it's just, it's observability and repeatability. Like yeah. what? Anyway, totally dumb. Uh, I guess just as a kind of bonus side, and we'll let, move on to the last question. What, hypothetically, uh, what would, sh would, sh would, would or should someone do or could do to say, all right, there's a need for a classical K through eight or K through 12 in my area at our church uh, we like homeschool, but I think it'd be beneficial to do X. What would you recommend someone, you know, a few, like few steps to do to kind of, you know, real practical things that, you know, they could say, all right, from January, 2023 to X, you know, six months down the road, 18 months down the road, what are some steps to take and, and kind of preparation? Just, just hypothetically say, I'm not saying we're doing that, uh, but no, just, well I, I think that um, I, I think that one of the first things I would do for somebody in that situation would I, I would reach out to the Association of Classical Christian Schools (ACCS) okay. because that's that's their that's their thing is you reach out to them they say here's the starter kit here's how we get you started and I think they can do quite a lot to walk you through the specifics because there's a whole host of just very pragmatic simple things that you could spend three years messing around. And then it was a, a 10 second conversation that, Oh, this is the thing we've been looking <laughs> yeah. for. So I would want to get help because there's, there's quite a lot of help out there. The other thing I would say would be, um, I really think that having a, at least one, but ideally five to six pastors in the area that believe in the significance of a Christian education and want to, um, want to support it, want to teach on it, want to encourage their congregation in that direction. When you have when you have a group of churches that are all see the importance of it and want to get behind it and support it, then you have um, critical mass really quick. Um, when it's just um, one family who's laboring under a conviction kind of out by themselves, it's very difficult to um, get that momentum going. But I would mm -hmm. start talking to pastors and find who here shares the sentiment would even be willing to preach on it um, or at the, at the, you know, mo at, at the least, at least have like a, uh, a Wednesday night, something where they would talk about the significance of a Christian education. It would encourage their congregation in this direction. Yeah. Okay. No, that's great. Um, well, related to education for children, last question. Um, so a lot of us have kids, right? And, yeah. and or people want to have kids and, you know, that's the Christian thing to do. It's the human thing to do, but Christians seem to be the only ones who want to do it these days. Uh, but we want to, okay, get our kids out of public school. Government schools are bad, but, uh, you know, a church is still, church is still, and I go to a good church and, and that's good, you know, and, and that's it. Um, and they'll teach them that in Sunday school or they'll, they'll, you know, even if it's uh, family worship, it'll still get picked up. You know, or maybe we'll do a Bible study here and there. But I think there's, you know, again, we can lay the blame on all sorts of different people and things and reasons. But there's still, I think, I, at least from my vantage point, a big disconnect between raising of children and just the overall training and, and what, you know, something even like baptism is and, mm -hmm. and, and what, what you do with that. And there's kind of different camps. Of course, there's standard, you know, believers baptism versus, uh, uh, um, infant baptism or what do y'all call it again? Pedo baptism, right? Yeah. Pedo, uh, yeah. versus credo. Yeah. But, and even within that, there's like, Oh, well, we want to make sure you're saved first before we baptize you. You know, you need to show evidence versus, well, no, you see from Acts 16, for example, it says they believed and they were baptized. Yeah. Um, what is, what was your background? You said you were standard kind of evangelical American. Yeah. Um, so you, I believe you didn't take uh pedo baptism, that wasn't your conviction originally. Right? No, no, I became Pato Baptist um, after I became reformed. Okay, gotcha. Uh, flesh that out a little bit for us, because there's a lot of people that still, um, you know, what are, what are some reasons? What is what's the scripture you look at 
And then how does that uh, work with children coming to faith and all the rest? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I came to the Pado Baptist conviction, you know, I, I'd, I'd gone through um, becoming Calvinistic um, and that was just sort of the, um, a total slug fest um, for, for me to get there. Um, but after I became Calvinistic, um, the next thing was becoming covenantal. Okay. Um, and that was kind of tied to eschatology. Um, I, I really was getting into, um, I actually wasn't attending a reformed church. Um, I was attending a church that was quite hostile to the reformed faith. Um, but I was becoming reformed in the midst of it. Um, I actually visited Christ church once while I was an undergrad, um, thinking about, well, maybe I could go to Christ church. And I remember there was a sermon that Sunday on, um, the significance of church membership and why you shouldn't be a church hopper. Mm-hmm. And I was like, shoot, now I need to stay at this other church. <laughs> <laughs> I so I, I did stay. Um, but that church, uh, was really into pre-mill everything. And, um, that, that drove me to scripture and drove me really to a covenantal framework and a post-millennial eschatology. And then after I graduated, that's when I started going to Christchurch. Um, okay. But it was that covenantal framework that really set it up for me, and particularly seeing the gospel as something that uh, went all the way back to my, through my Old Testament to the covenant, you know, made with Abraham, um, and even before uh, to the, the, the proto Evangelion, and seeing this long, consistent story of this promise to God, God's people that uh, regularly included his promise to his children. Uh, and so that, that's really what, what clinched it for me was understanding that um, the gospel is a, is a promise to me that I'm to now expect to um, pass on to my children. And it's something I want to claim for my children. Um, and I think that, um, you know, some of our conversation beforehand um, that there, um, I, I think that, um, one of the things that that I, I see, uh, you know, one of the problems that I see out there is um, a a mistake about what it means to raise your kids to be Christians. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think, and, and to give them a Christian upbringing, um, you know, I, we mentioned classical education, classical Christian education, and I think one of the dangers of something like a classical Christian education, I do think there's a danger here, is that parents, um, well, Christians are like this. We get, um, we get stuck on methods where, where, you know, I read a book by Doug Wilson about classical Christian education, and this is apparently what you're supposed to do. So I put my kids in a classical Christian school. Um, I also read his book on say courtship. So we did courtship and I read, and, 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 and you get this like list of things that you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And then you do all the things. I baptized them as infants. I did this, I did whatever. And, and it's, you know, I read this book. I was con- convinced of the argument. So I followed this method and at the end, my kids tubed it, flamed out. And my daughter's a lesbian over here now and hate, hates God and hates me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, their, and their complaint is always, I did everything right. I did everything on the list. I ticked all the boxes. I did classical education. I did whatever. I did homeschool. I did. Um, and they miss the thing that is what what brings these kids to faith, which is, I, I think, you're, you need to disciple them. And I, I think that frequently we confuse good logistics with good discipleship. Um there's lots of advice out there on good logistics, um, you know, how to shop, how to cook, how to um, how to, you know, give them the right education, how to do all these different things. But um, and, and logistics are important. But in the middle of all of it has to be actual loving discipleship, which means preaching the gospel to them with how you live. That's that, which is huge. Um mm-hmm. How you live matters. If you say all the right things, but you're a jerk, um, it's not going to have any effect. So how you live in yeah. front of them and then how you constantly um, disciple them. Do you, you know, pray with them? Uh, you know, for us, we baptized our kids as infants, but that didn't mean we didn't, we didn't evangelize them. Every time they got a spanking, we sat there and walked through the gospel with them. Like, why, why, why do we... Um, we 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 
um, we have a spanking. We, they say they're sorry. We pray and we say, you're all forgiven. What do we mean by you're all forgiven? And, and you're going to the gospel every single time. And you're talking about Jesus, what he did for them and raising them in, in that world uh -huh. where, where the gospel explains the world for them, explains for them why their parents are the way they are and, and who they are. So I, I think that, that, that discipleship and that constant preaching of the gospel to your children has to be really emphasized. And you can't compensate for that by, well, I, I baptize them as infants or I um, homeschool them or I chose this whatever method of education. None of that makes up for the fact that you have to evangelize them. Gotcha. Okay. So is there, I know Roman Catholics do like confirmation, right? Obviously they do the infant baptism mm -hmm. thing as well. Uh, do you guys do that? Uh, in the CREC or, or just Presbyterian in general PCA type thing, or is it just, you know, baptizing them? Cause it basically baptism seen as, as kind of the new circumcision more or less, yeah. right. As, as, as a covenantal promise. Cause obviously baptism doesn't save as a Baptist, Southern Baptist, although I'm just yeah. Baptistic, whatever. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know any, well, I do <laughs> take that back. I do know people who do believe that baptism does save you because they, you know, cite Peter uh, first Peter three which of course I actually just read an article, wrote an article on that, which it doesn't cause he's not even talking about that, but baptism doesn't always mean water, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but do you guys have anything more, you know, you baptize a six month old or a year old or something yeah. uh, or a newborn. Is there anything more or is it still, Hey, I'm professing faith. And now, you know, I'm, I'm walking with Christ. Right. You know, I say as a child, as a 10 year old, 15 year old, whatever. So, so, um, in the in the in the Pado Baptist world, you've got baptism as an infant, and then there are varying takes on when that child should come to communion. I think there's a a lot of the Pado Baptist world that would treat communion um, like what you're describing. It's it uh, it honestly looks to me a lot like the way a uh, a Baptist would treat baptism. A lot of Pado, Pado Baptists treat communion that way. Okay. So they would have you, you can't come to the table until you've been examined by the elders, made profession of faith and demonstrate right. all of these things. Um, so that's pretty common in the Pado Baptist world. We would be, um, we're a little different than that. Our, our take would be once a, once a baby is, um, well, it wouldn't be a baby. Once a young child is at the place where they are, consciously a part of the worship service where they're participating in the worship service, mm -hmm. then we would encourage them to come to the Lord's supper at that point. So our kids would all come to the Lord's supper, you know, usually uh, before they were two between one and two, because, um, and, and, and one of the things that ties with this is a particular kind of worship service. So we have a, 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 um, a liturgical service that involves, standing, sitting, kneeling, praying, raising your hands. Um, it, it's something you're physically involved in. And so it's something that a one and a half year old can be, um, can be trained to be a part of this. And once they were a part of the worship service, we would want them to be taking the Lord's Supper. So there would not be a later, um, you know, when they're 12 years old, I'm, I'm not looking for a, um, a um, conversion story. Um, uh, like I, I want my kids to, because the, the thing is I was raised in a Christian family. I was raised Baptist. Um, and I was, I had this idea that I I'm supposed to like, I have to go through a transformation before I can take the baptism. But the problem was I believed Jesus the whole time. Like, I can't think of a time when I didn't believe in the gospel. I, I know there was a time when I wasn't, um, living the way I should have. But yeah. um, I, I always I always knew the truth of it. And I didn't get baptized until like right at the very end of college because I couldn't figure out, like, where's where's the moment that, that it happened? Um, and uh, and I think for most kids that are raised in a Christian house, um, if you raise them like this, they 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 can't find that that moment. Um, and my concern is that by if you're insisting on that one moment now, I'm not saying it doesn't happen for some people. For some people, they're riding with the hell's angels. You know, they were in prison and then yeah. God just in one miraculous sort of uh, road to Damascus moment, they're transformed. So that clearly yeah. happens. But for most kids that are raised in a Christian church, it's really hard to find that spot. Um, and I, I think that it, it is. Um, you can set kids up to doubt their faith 
if you say there has to be this moment because they're mm. constantly thinking, well, I haven't had it yet. So maybe I'm not even a Christian. Yeah, no, that I, I appreciate you saying that. That's really helpful because even yeah, me growing up and, and I know a lot of people like that as well, both personally and just in general have experienced that. And I know for us, uh, my wife and I, she was baptized much younger. Uh, I was baptized at 20 and it's like, you know, was I really a believer? I don't know. I mean, yeah, sure. I guess I, but I didn't know anything, <laughs> you know, yeah. and obviously knowing stuff doesn't necessarily save you, right? Faith in Christ yeah. saves you. Uh, but it, it, there definitely was a marked difference between my life of, you know, sin for lack of a better word and all the American 20 something year old guy, you can fill uh -huh. in the blanks on that. And, and then understanding oh, the gospel is about Christ and what he has done, not what I'm doing, not me being a good person and God liking me, et cetera, et cetera. And so I didn't, I didn't believe, you know, had I believed a gospel at all, it wouldn't have been the right one, right? It was, it was, yeah. you know, this gospel of works and, and things. Uh, so I was baptized way before that. And then, you know, coming to faith several years later or a few years later, uh, baptized again, I guess, but, mm. um, and my wife, same way. And, but there, there's still like we did, ha we did have a uh, baptism class. There was a couple of weeks of like, okay, what baptism is, and this and this, and of yeah. course from a kind of credo uh, believer baptism type vantage point. But even still, I've talked to many and are hearing testimonies or you know Q and As or conversations just like this, and and people don't, you know, some guy does have a crazy testimony, and some girl, you know, it's just they almost died, and she's this and this, and now she just loves Christ, and, and then there's other stuff that you're like. Well, yeah. I mean, I've always, I, I, I've always believed, you know, and yeah. you look at, and I, I always have to, we got to run back to scripture, right? What, what yeah. does the text say? What are we, what are we experiencing? Cause it says, you know, here the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Good example of believers baptism and immersion. Okay. That's mm -hmm. a good, a good example. I would argue, but some people disagree. Fine. <laughs> uh, but either way, he's, he's like, I believe, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, Philip's like, yeah, well, there's water. And he's like, yeah, what, what can I can I do it like right now? Mm -hmm. And so there's this immediacy versus, well, let's make sure they bear fruit. And it's like right. well, they're a child, you know, like they're literally an infant, even if they're 25 years old, they don't know anything other than, oh, I'm a sinner and God sent Jesus to save me and I have to try. I, I trust him. OK, yeah. I believe that I, I deserve death and I believe. OK, now what? You know, yeah. and if you do that as a 25 year old is it, or or whatever age and you've gotten wet before or not, you know, and there's still this point of belief, right? And, and and you see that. And a lot of times when you go to the scripture, there isn't this, like you said, Damascus Road experience. Of course, yeah. Paul's, Saul's, yeah. but. So, so I mean, just, just to be clear, we we obviously believe in believer's baptism that, that um, so at, at Christ Church, we would baptize on profession of faith, uh, a baptism that would be identical to what you would do, where, um, somebody just got converted and, um, you know, 35 year old man who's the Holy Spirit has worked a massive work of conversion and transformation in his life. Absolutely. Get him up front and baptize him. Um, but we would say, um, as I think that the covenant promise is always framed, this promise is for you and for your children. So it's we've not just baptized him, his household. He needs to he needs to bring his house to God and, okay. and commit his house to God. Okay. And would you, would you look at things like act 16, like with Lydia and the Philippian jailer and places like that, that say the household or, or well, I, I think that those are the kinds of places that it's consistent with a, 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 a covenantal pedo Baptist understanding. I would, um, I would not want, I think that it would be weak to say, this is the foundation of the argument. I will put the foundation of the argument in the, in the covenant. And I would be going all the way back to Genesis 12, Genesis 15, 17 gotcha. and, and building from, from there. Um, so, so then when, so, so if you have this covenantal understanding of the gospel as a promise to you and to your children, um, then when you see it say, and uh, um, him and his household, I would say, okay, this is exactly what we would expect to see in, if this understanding is true, but if you cut off your whole old Testament, um, then all of a sudden uh, that passage by itself is, I, I could see why a Baptist would say that seems kind of weak. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. Okay. 
Well, I appreciate it. This was that was all our our questions. Do you have any closing thoughts or, or words of encouragement you want to share? Yeah, I appreciate the chance to be on here. Good to talk to you. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, brother. Well, everybody, check out NSA, uh, New St. Andrews College, not National Spying Agency. Uh, totally <laughs> different. Or what is is it technically surveillance? I know it's on spying. Uh, <laughs> security agency, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's all <laughs> it's all the government. But NSA, New St. Andrews College, there in Moscow. Um, lots of great stuff. If you don't know Canon Press, of course, they've got a bunch of things there on, on child rearing and old classics, as well as new books from lots of different authors. And yeah, it's, it's been a pleasure brother. And, uh, I'll, I'll keep that in mind with the classical education and, and maybe take some steps toward that. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, take care and uh, have a blessed day. See ya. See ya.